Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very special event, Focus on Health. Today, we have so much to talk about, and our focus remains, how are we as a community, as Hartford Hospital, as Hartford Healthcare, moving to make ourselves better than we were before, to be better than normal? We have a really interesting group of speakers here today. Um, I do want to point out that, of course, we are on Zoom. So I, by now, I imagine most of you know the drill, but we do want to make sure that we're going to just go through a few specifics so that you're not going to be seeing all the participants at once. You will see, just like you're seeing me in this moment, you'll see the speakers as they appear and as they're speaking. At the bottom of your screen, you can offer questions and answers. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It's actually a little different. It's to the left of the chat button. So if you see that down below and you can actually click on that Q&A, it makes it a little bit easier for us to take your questions and make sure that we get them and we can answer them. So take a look, you'll see they're two different. There's a chat and then a Q&A. So we would love for you to use that and engage. This is really a conversation and we want to make sure we're having that conversation with you. So thank you for taking part in this Focus on Health as we together become better than normal. It is my great pleasure to introduce Hartford Hospital's Vice President of Philanthropy, Lynn Rossini. Lynn. Hello, Rebecca, and hello to all of our guests. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us today. This is an opportunity, as Rebecca said, for us to have a conversation with you. Um, I want to take a moment to thank Dr. Sakara for joining us. I think this topic really resonates with so many people of all walks of life. So thank you, Dr. Sakara, for helping us to all understand the challenges that we are facing. On another note, we're excited to share with you that on Saturday, March 5th, we'll be live once again for Black and Red. It's the largest and most successful gala in the region, and we're all really excited about that. This year, we'll recognize the Institute of Living as it celebrates its 200th anniversary. The funds raised will support the mental health challenges that we're facing both locally and throughout the state. And I also want to thank all of you as 2021 comes to an end. We want to thank you for always, always remembering Hartford Hospital in your philanthropic plans. If you have any questions or you'd like to make a difference yourselves, please reach out to me or one of the uh, philanthropy team members. We'd love to have a conversation with you. And in ending, I'd like to just wish all of you happy holidays and a really Merry Christmas. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Bimbo Patel, President of Hartford and Northwest Region and the Senior VP of Hartford Healthcare. Bimbo. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, thank you all the speakers and all the members of the community who have joined us today uh, on Focus on Health. Um, I wanted to take a moment uh, on the eve of our holiday season uh, to thank uh, our communities for their support and our staff members who have done uh, yeoman's work and they continue to do so uh, in the middle of a pandemic uh, with the highest intensity of uh, sickness. Uh, they are staying uh, and supporting uh, the, the front line. So I couldn't be more grateful uh, and thank our leadership uh, team uh, for the amazing work that they do here. Uh, I just wanted to share a few thoughts about where Hartford Hospital is and where Hartford Healthcare is under leadership of our Hartford Healthcare CEO, Jeffrey Flex. Uh, we have made amazing strides uh, over uh, last few years, uh, especially during the pandemic, not continue uh, to, uh, and, and continue to work and improve uh, what, uh, the access is in the community and what the quality is for our patients and our communities. So we have remained focused in uh, all the fronts, uh, pandemic and non-pandemic. Uh, the great uh, work uh, that has been done has been recognized nationally by various different organizations that I'd like to share with you today, a uh, few of those. Leapfrog A uh, rating was received by Hartford Hospital uh, for this fall. Uh, this rating is received by only eight 
hospitals in the state of Connecticut. Four hospitals belong to Hartford Healthcare and Hartford Hospital is one of that hospital. This is the first time in the history of Hartford Hospital receiving this award for uh, great quality and safety work uh, that has been done. Uh, and so it's a, a major milestone in our journey. A couple of days ago, we were announced the top 100 hospital teaching hospital in the country as well. We are among the top 67 organizations in the nation who received this particular award. Uh, again, from LeapFrog, quality and safety, leading the work uh, in uh, the heels of pandemic uh, for a tertiary medical center to reach that level of achievement is also by itself remarkable. And once again, it's, uh, it shows that we are, our quality work has been recognized nationally. The Society for Thoracic Surgeons uh, uh, recognized Hartford Hospital for four years in a row, seventh consecutive uh, period, 14 out of the 15 categories, the highest star ratings. What that means is that our cardiac program uh, has been recognized not only by SDS, but also awarded by Joint Commission. Uh, and that's a great uh, standard of care within this, uh, our country for healthcare, uh, that we are the comprehensive cardiac care center, first one in New England. Entire New England, we are the only organization and only 14 hospitals received this across the country. And we are one of them. So our program, and our institutes are continue to thrive uh, and lead putting Hartford Hospital on a map. 500 heart transplants were completed last month. Uh, this is a flagship uh, journey in, in transplantation program. Uh, this year and the last year, we were the highest heart transplant uh, center in New England uh, compared to Yale and Mass General. Once again, uh, that signifies that Hartford Hospital in its vision of being a thousand plus bed hospital, nationally renowned in the top 20 category, those aspirations are coming to become actual in a short while. And I'm so proud of uh, this journey uh, on behalf of our organization. Lifestar, as you know, is our flagship program that uh, brings the sickest of the sick patients from other hospitals or the emergency department to Hartford Hospital and or from the scene where the accident might have occurred and the patient uh, needed that level of intervention. <clears throat> that program also gets a national certification and recognition. Uh, we just received that recognition and certification to uh, have continued their presence in our market, which is a great news uh, for our broader communities that rely on Hartford Hospitals capacity and capabilities. Comprehensive stroke certification was another major milestone for anybody who needs that level of intervention and a care 24 seven, 365 days a year. Uh, Hartford Hospitals program uh, is there uh, in support and we have helped thousands of patients annually uh, in their uh, caring for uh, the stroke disease. We cannot forget about our work that uh, during the pandemic year one and year two that we have done with testing as well as vaccination. Currently, Hartford Hospital staff members are vaccinated 99.7%, uh, less than um, 100 individuals uh, decided uh, and have clinical reasons not to take vaccine, uh, but otherwise uh, we are fully vaccinated workforce and I am so grateful and thankful for their efforts uh, in keeping our patients safe, keeping our colleagues safe, keeping our communities safe. During this time, uh, we have seen uh, an upsurge uh, in our mental health diseases and our challenges to uh, managing both pandemic and other related endemic of behavioral health. And today's topic is significantly important uh, for Dr. Sukera to talk about uh, the impact of our uh, Institute of Living, uh, our broader behavioral health network is making uh, on behalf of Hartford Healthcare for the state of Connecticut and it's all of its residents. As you know, 
IOL turns 200 year this year, and we are going to celebrate that uh, in an upcoming black and red event, as Lynn mentioned earlier. Hartford Healthcare's Behavioral Health Network is one of the largest behavioral health network in the state of Connecticut. And we are absolutely committed to uh, mental health and well being of people who work within our organization, who depend for their services on our organization, and a community at large. Uh, and with that note, I just wanted to say thank you once again. I wish everybody a great, happy holidays. Uh, and be safe there. Uh, please get vaccinated. Please wear masks. Uh, and uh, you know that we are here for you. Uh, and I am certain that despite all these uh, challenges, we will come through and get through to a better side uh, because uh, we can count on you and you can count on us. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, have a wonderful day. Thanks, Bimal. So now, the moment you have all been waiting for, it is our great pleasure to introduce someone who is very special. He is newer to our organization. Dr. Javid Sikara is the chair, the newest chair of psychiatry at the Institute of Living, chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Hartford Hospital, academic affiliations with the University of Connecticut and Yale University. He comes to us from Western University in London and Ontario, Canada. His research program explores novel approaches to addressing stigma, to addressing bias among health professionals. And of course, he has been very involved in advocacy and cross-sectional work in education, policing, community service. So this has been a year like no other. We know that there is a need for psychologic, psychiatric services like never before. And here to talk about how do we do this? How do we get to the other side? How do we get better at getting better? Here to answer some of that, to share a wonderful presentation, and then really to answer your questions, Dr. Javid Sakara, welcome. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and the invitation to speak and join you all today. I'm really um, excited to be here, uh, to be part of this organization, and that all of you are sharing some time today to talk about where we are at this cross section of history. So I'll get started with my presentation and look forward to a chance for some discussion in a few moments. What I'm going to try to do uh, briefly is frame a series of four questions. I want you to reflect on why you're here, why you're here listening to this topic at this moment, tell you a little bit about why I'm here, talk about why we're here as a collective, particularly those of us working in behavioral health, and then discuss a little bit of where we can go from here. So to start off with, I'd like you to consider why you're here. This has been a year, two years, like no other. There have been so many ruptures and disruptions in terms of what we perceive is normal or predictable. So I'd like you to spend a few quiet moments of reflection asking yourself these questions. Think about how you tolerate uncertainty, how the pandemic has affected how you engage with difficult conversations. How has the past year and a half affected how you take care of yourself? your well-being, physically, mentally, spiritually? And how has the pandemic affected how you feel about the work that you do? Take a moment to think about that. And keep your reflection apart because I'm going to ask you to come back and think about it a bit later. Well, I'll share with you a little bit of my story. Now, my career has had many twists and turns, um, and ultimately it's led me to Hartford for the next chapter of my personal and professional life. I grew up in Toronto, Canada, the child of immigrants to Canada from Pakistan, who came in the 60s and 70s. I trained all over the world, 
drawn to uh, experiences related to global health and cross-cultural medicine. But it wasn't until I started my career as a psychiatrist that I began to realize that one of the biggest equity issues in healthcare was staring me in the face. And that was the inequitable way in which we treat people who seek mental or behavioral health care. When they walk through the doors of acute care organizations or they build up the courage to ask for help, despite our best efforts, they are not always provided unconditional empathy. In fact, many experience shame and blame. And over time, they internalize that shame and blame and start to feel that they are part of the problem. As a result, and we found this through our research, there's a deep mistrust that develops with healthcare. The other consequence is that the pervasive effects of discrimination mean that anyone who suffers from mental illness tends to have poor outcomes. There's a risk of earlier death, even when corrected for other factors. And this discrimination and prejudice is pervasive and pre prevalent throughout sectors and systems beyond just, just healthcare. So my career really has been about understanding this discrimination and inequity and addressing it, but also considering other forms of intersectional discrimination and inequity when we consider other factors like gender and race. But part of who I am is my lived experience. And I wanna share with you all that tragically earlier this year in the city where I used to live, friends of ours went for a walk on a Sunday evening and were murdered because they looked visibly different. Um, and they were killed by someone who was looking for Muslims to kill in a hate crime. So part of why I'm here is not because this is an intellectual exercise or because this is about uh, jargon or lingo, but because this issue of inequity and prejudice really cuts to the heart of what it means to belong in our communities and what it means to feel safe and comfortable. Well, I'm privileged to be joining an organization that's about to celebrate its 200th year anniversary. Part of why we are here is because the Institute of Living, as, you, as many of you know, is an incredible organization steeped in history and tradition. But most importantly, the IOL is poised to continue to be a beacon and light to behavioral health care across the nation and, in fact, across the world. We were founded 200 years ago under the principle of moral treatment which really centered the idea of humane care, the idea of freeing sufferers from mental and behavioral illness from shackles and chains. It was founded around emancipatory ideals centered on honoring and centering emotions and humanity. So we're here because we are part of this moment and we are potentially leaders and beacons and leading us forward as light through this darkness. This moment is one we have to acknowledge and honor as well. The term pandemic flux has been used in many circles to describe what it's like mentally, emotionally right now. There are many who are experiencing blunted emotions. We're seeing spikes, of course, in anxiety and depression and substance use. Yet many day to day experiencing the strange desire to drastically change something about their lives. We're also seeing acute anxiety. People's nerves are frayed. This shows in the workplace is restlessness, conflict, sadness, and a sense of detachment. The pandemic has had different effects for different people. Many have experienced grief and loss, but for many people, our brains and bodies are simply so fatigued from constantly recalibrating to these new circumstances that feel like they're too much to bear. In part, that's because many of us are relying on coping with this chronic and uncertain stressor with a sense of surge capacity, 
which is described as this adaptive systems, mental and physical, that we draw on for short-term survival. But they're meant to be drawn on for short term, not to be constantly prolonged or challenged through new threats and, and challenges in the media cycle as we fear uh, new variants that have to move forward with caution, yet still foreground hope somehow. We're also here because this isn't just a moment, it's a movement. The volcano of racism has spilled over. Although many have felt its heat for centuries, the entire world has now faced the consequences of what happens when we come face to face with the inhuman way in which some of us are treated. Racism, racial trauma, and foregrounding racial healing are also a big part of the syndemic of where we've experienced the past few months. As we come to terms with a world that isn't or wasn't what we seemed, it has had profound consequences on what we believe about ourselves and how we think about our future. Now, our research, my team previously looked at these experiences in acute healthcare. We looked at healthcare organizations. And what we found was this shame and blame that people with mental illness experience really feeds a perpetual cycle of disconnection and mistrust. We're also here today as leaders in mental and behavioral health care because to a certain extent, the norms of how we practice what we do have strayed from those ideals. People are labeled, stereotyped. There's an avoidance because many times in healthcare organizations, we look for fixes. People with mental illness, our research found, are perceived as unfixable, which leads well-intentioned health providers to avoid because there isn't a sense of self-efficacy. They're not used to being helpful. But that leads to a sense of helplessness and frustration. Yet that avoidance we found is perceived by patients and caregivers as discrimination and judgment. And this cycle of disconnection and mistrust is spinning out of control. We see its consequences in some of the coercive practices that we've normalized in how we deliver care. But we've also seen its consequences in the rising rates of things like young people struggling with depression and anxiety. What we've created inadvertently is a system that's dichotomized, a system where power is sought and hoarded, a system where we vacillate between seeking power and experiencing powerlessness. Yet what I would argue and our research has found is that far too often, for so many of us, our power is invisible to us. We look to others with structural power to make change. Yet when we look at how we use our power, we tend to hoard it. We tend to design systems that are centered in our needs as organizations or providers. And I would challenge that paradigm as we imagine or reimagine what the future could look like. And that's because we all have power. We are all part of shaping the structures, the policies, the practices and norms that govern how we deliver care, how we design systems of care, how we can redesign or co-design a system that provides the kind of hope and empathy that people who are suffering needs. So then the question is, where do we go? From here, how do we navigate this uncertain future, despite the many challenges that we're facing in terms of morale, uncertainty, infection control and prevention, workforce challenges, funding challenges? In the midst of all of this, I believe that we need to, in fact, we must foreground hope and foreground healing as we look to the future. We are all standing on a bridge. In the view ahead, is unclear. Rather than jumping forward, I believe that it's about us holding hands and stepping forward together. Breaking this cycle of disconnection and mistrust requires that we break the silence. Our research has found that speaking up about some of these coercive practices and inequities 
having the courage to acknowledge our vulnerabilities and our humanness, engaging with one another with compassion instead of avoidance, and seeking and building trust and connection might be what can help us get there. We need to recognize the dichotomization in our system, the ways in which shame and blame perpetuate in times of stress. We often see ourselves as the good people, as the people that don't stigmatize, people struggling with mental illness or challenges. And we think of others that do. But that leads us to spend all kinds of energy pointing fingers of shame and blame and polarizing cycles. Our research has found that if we want change when we see inequity, our energy is better directed at looking in the mirror at ourselves. We also need to interrogate the paradigms in which we work. How do we as organizations seek to address issues of quality and quality improvement? Do we frame what we do for our workforce with a sense of toxic perfectionism where we expect people to do more, add more, check boxes? Or do we acknowledge progress? Do we accept that the safest organization is the organization where people feel brave? The organization where people can be open about mistakes and adopt a growth mindset. The other thing to remember is that we are often caught in system improvement in a sea of buzzwords, catchphrases, flavors of the month, things that have 15 minutes of fame, but often don't resonate with the very human experience of the people seeking care and delivering care on the front lines. There are two ideas I'm gonna share with you briefly from our research that I believe can help us reimagine the future for the IOL and really focus on co-writing the next chapter of the IOL's history. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna to touch on them briefly, but there are two ideas that have come from some of our work. One speaks to the concept of inclusive leadership and the other to the concept of shared humanity. Inclusive leadership requires all of us to remember that whether we have structural positions of leadership or not, we all have the power of influence. We can all role model a different way of being. But the, what that requires is for us to step back from the urge to fix everything, to build the capacity for our systems and our staff to sit with heavy and complex emotions, to role model the courage to be vulnerable and open, encourage sharing, but to create spaces that are brave, spaces where people are willing to have tough conversations with one another as we accept diverse ways of coping. Shared humanity is a product of some of our work. We designed this framework with young people who had lived experiences of discrimination within the health system and students of different health professions such as medicine and nursing. We looked at shared humanity as a mechanism a tool, a way of thinking about how bias, stigma, and prejudice manifest in our clinical environments. The framework is centered around three pillars, sharing trust, sharing power, and sharing humanity. It requires recognizing that far too often there is an us versus them mentality. And we see this manifest not only in our teams, across complex organizations, but often between patients, families, and systems. Sharing trust requires building systems that center themselves on feedback, cultivating feedback. And this, this framework aligns very well with a strong culture at Hartford Healthcare that's built around patient safety behaviors, difficult and courageous conversations, and leadership behaviors. It requires we create systems by co-creating them with people who have lived in living experience. And that means considering their experiences and honoring them, not tokenizing them, not just inviting them to our tables, but actually encouraging them to be the designers of the future system. It requires reconsidering what we think of as expertise and collaborating with humility. And that's part of sharing power, communicating transparently and ensuring accountability as we consider some of the most marginalized and vulnerable members of our communities 
um, as we amplify their sense of agency and control over unpredictable systems of care. And sharing humanity is the heart of all of this. Far too often our research has found we as health professionals are encouraged to literally and figuratively armor up when we face distress, to compartmentalize who we are. And we see this all the time. We see this mask that so many of us wear. And we've seen it in healthcare, particularly behavioral healthcare contribute to disconnection. Bringing us back to the principles we were founded on requires that we not consider us versus them, staff versus patients, providers versus one another, but ground ourselves in the shared humanity we have as deeply vulnerable, flawed humans that are working together across this power differential to help create spaces for healing. Our model really fosters what we would call co-regulation at times of stress. If we think about all the challenges we're facing at this moment, all the tensions and stresses across systems, across sectors, we also have to consider how to ensure those seeking care understand our system, recognize their stereotypes towards us as people working in the system, how they can help build trust in the relationship and how we can help cultivate feedback. Well, what it ultimately means is that wherever we go and however we get there, we're doing so together. So I'm gonna sort of end with a few comments about self-compassion because this is another key aspect of what I think we need to center how we approach the future on. Far too often when we find ourselves in these moments, and I know many leaders have experienced this, we can find ourselves falling into the traps of self-blame and self-criticism. We're often so worried and concerned about being right that we don't remember or anchor ourselves in the fact that we just have to work on getting it right. We need to ground ourselves in self-kindness and self-validation if we are going to weather these storms and move forward together. At the end of the day, we don't have to do any of this alone. We were never meant to. And that's why I'm grateful to you all for being part of our community and grateful that you've joined us today for this dialogue on how we can move our systems forward. I continue to believe that the IOL can and will be a leader, that we will be looked to nationally and internationally as we reimagine mental and behavioral health care in fundamentally less coercive ways, as we honor our tradition, but as we look forward to our future with excitement and anticipation. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so important. I, I love your optimism as we look forward. We do want to remind you, this is the moment. We have a few questions in the works, but this is the moment when we, after listening to this wonderful presentation and, and really asking yourselves, why am I here? I love what you talked about when you talked about somebody being unfixable and how folks in healthcare look at that and say, what can I do? So I loved that you looked at both sides, sort of that patient perspective, and then also really trying to figure out how do I make sure I don't come into the world with that bias? So as we develop questions, and I see that some are popping in, one that came up with your new role, and welcome, this is what some folks are saying, um, can you talk a little about access? We've been hearing so much. What is your perspective? How do we help our world access healthcare, specifically mental health? I, it, talking about the bias is so important, but how do we change access to experts like yourself? Well, it's a great question. And I think it's definitely a word that has come up time and time again. My perspective is that the concept of access means very different things to different people. And so before we can think about improving our system, we have to make sure we have a shared understanding of what access means. Ultimately, I truly believe that the best way that we can build or reimagine systems to improve access is actually to bring patient and caregiver service user perspectives to the table. Um, we at the IOL are looking at different ways to do that. For example, part of our goals and ambitions uh, in addition to, to working at the Bicentennial is thinking about a redesign of our ambulatory services. 
And we know that we have to have the voices of people who are seeking care at the table. We, we often see things from different perspectives and we aren't always effective at bringing diverse perspectives to a table to challenge us to think differently. But also when we invite those perspectives, we can sometimes feel a bit threatened and we're all susceptible. I'm susceptible to that too, um, by feedback that, it, that people might be able to provide. So I truly believe that if, if we want to improve access um, beyond having that shared understanding, we need to get out of the way and ask about what are the ways in which access is, uh, can be improved. In particular, I'm a child psychiatrist, so I would say that many young people actually have some of the best and at times most disruptive innovations to offer, particularly as we think about the digital space. But ultimately, it's about shifting away from thinking about a system where someone has a lack and someone has something to offer to creating a system where we're able to give people tools and a sense of agency, predictability, and control uh, over what they can access, what they want, and how they can access it. Great perspective. Uh, we have a great question from Jerry Lupacino. Do you think there is a permanent change in the definition of stress where we're learning to tolerate higher levels emotionally in the short term, but physically need to evolve over the next generation with regards to stress-related health issues? Fascinating question, especially as you look at the impact of the last two years. How does that impact the range of care and the services that we might provide? Great question. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, we can always count on Jerry for fantastic questions. So I, I'll share a couple of perspectives on this. Now, part of my own journey has been working in some challenging global settings. Even uh, in my practice in Canada, I worked a lot with survivors of trauma and war. I've worked with child soldiers, uh, many newcomers who had been in refugee camps for years. And so the definition of stress is something I think we need to appreciate is gonna seem different to different people. For so many of us, the pandemic was and is a completely different kind of stress. Um, but for so many, you know, they're used to not being in control or they're used to not having a sense of predictability. And, and that can seem scary or it can and seem like something that divides us, but I actually think that this shared vulnerability at this moment in time is something that can unite us. So I don't so much think that there's a permanent change in the definition of stress, but I think that people across different uh, potential divides, diverse groups, newcomers, people across the globe have a newfound appreciation for what it means to be vulnerable and what it means to not feel like you're in a sense of control. Ultimately, we've got science to anchor ourselves to. And we know from the work of amazing scientists that a sense of control, predictability, and moderation can help all of us in terms of our brains uh, dealing with short-term and long-term stress. So I think the difference is we've relied on strategies that were fixed strategies, right? How do I change how I'm feeling? And the, the pandemic has challenged us to, to rely more on meaning-focused strategies, which relate to how does this moment connect to the greater meaning of what I do and what really matters. And I think that as we recalibrate our systems, attention to that meaning making is going to be key, especially when we think about the workforce and the challenges that we face. We at Hartford Healthcare, and I mean, we were successful in recruiting me, so we continue to be a magnet for, for incredible people. But if we wanna keep incredible people in our organization, we have to really think about how this stress manifests in our workforce and make sure that we as leaders are tuned in, not again in a tokenistic or superficial way, but in a way that embraces the messiness of what this means with some of our staff so um, I, and some I, of the interactions that take I place. I love that conversation piece when you talk about the messiness and what we're experiencing because, uh, as I see my hands disappear, uh, it's fascinating, The just the follow-up question to some of this. On one hand, you have the messiness, this, this intense value that we've seen over the last two years, our, the work of healthcare, the work that we have been nationally recognized for has never mattered more. I think you see people feeling that about themselves. We see that even in what the community feels about this and some of the data and some of what we're seeing. On the flip side to that, that comes with intense work nonstop 
it's never ending. And now even sort of when Thanksgiving Day, the announcement, it, it, oh, a new variant. This is the reality. This isn't going away. This is life as we know it now. And I think Jerry touched on that a bit. But how are there tools that you can share with our viewers in this moment to say, all right, this is the world now. Do you say control in these little pieces? Or what are some tips and trades that you could offer us and then that we could even offer to our families, to our colleagues that could help us through this time that is stressful and won't be changing? Absolutely. So the first thing I want to do is acknowledge that I, I don't have all the answers. Um, you might be able to see that I have a splint here and that's because I slipped and fractured my elbow on top of a scary variant and, and cross-border travel and, and moving and starting a new job and, and all that. And so I think that the questions that I asked earlier in my presentation are what I would draw people's attention back to. I asked you all to think about how the pandemic affected how you tolerate uncertainty. But what I would challenge us to think about is how has this moment affected the kind of person we are and the kind of person we aspire to be? In the midst of everything that we're experiencing, I truly believe that there's sort of, um, there's, a, there's a scholar in racial trauma named Resma Menachem, and he writes about two forms of pain that are part of racial trauma. And I really think of this as a, as a way of thinking about this moment. There's clean pain and dirty pain. Mm -hmm. Dirty pain is the pain of doom scrolling, right? It gives us the dopamine hits. It's the constant news cycle, the fear, the amplification of anxiety, the tension, the fraying of nerves between us, the shame, the blame, right? It's the kind of pain that draws us like a magnet. Clean pain is the pain of growth. It's the pain of transcendence. It's the pain of our ancestors. It's the pain of generations to come. And I do think that part of the trauma of this moment of this past 18 months, the challenges we're all experiencing commands of us in healthcare and beyond to spend time with our clean pain and recognize the pull of the dirty pain, but resist that. And what that requires is again, centering and honoring our humanity, being open about being vulnerable with one another and not looking to fix everything because we can't. It ultimately means that we have to step forward into this uncertain future uh, one foot at a time with our feet on the ground and our heart in our hands, but with an open mind to what the future may hold, recognizing that we're not in control, but that doesn't mean that we can't still find a sense of predictability in our day-to-day -day lives by anchoring ourselves in what matters to us personally and professionally. That, I love that. I've never heard that phrase with the clean pain and the dirty pain and sort of, and that does give the user, right, in this distracted world where we can look at our, and we can scroll and we have our news feeds, a little bit of control to say, all right, maybe don't look at that in this moment. That I, that's, a, that's a helpful tool that I think um, gives, gives a lot of direction for us in this moment. Um, we have another great question, and thank you always for your insights from Erica Mora. What's your vision for striking the balance between supporting our stress staff? This kind of delves into what you were saying with the clean and the dirty pain, but again, who have undoubtedly gone through trauma over the last 18 months. But this is the answer, interesting question. How do we ensure folks are still embracing our patients with kindness, curiosity, and respect? Do we all require a different kind of training and support post-pandemic in our new world that we must make better than normal? Great question. Thank you, Erica. Nice to, to be sharing space with you virtually. And I think that the answer uh, lies in a lot of the research that we've done. And it requires a complete reframing of how we think of care. We think of care too often as the doing, the acts, the work. We think of it less as the being. So in terms of our staff, of course, there are so many of us that have endured hurt and trauma this year, but also there are many of us that have hurt and had hurt at other points in our lives. And part of the brokenness of the system that we've come face to face with is that in many ways, our system has encouraged us to push that under the rug, to push that hurt under the rug 
instead of spending time thinking about healing. And the pandemic is a moment where that volcano has erupted, right? We can't afford to turn away from our own hurt and our trauma. And so ultimately, I think it's a reframe. It's not this or that. I believe that if we create the kind of systems where staff feel that they can honor their humanness, then we're going to create systems that are compassionate, right? It's not a this or that or either or kind of dichotomization. And I think one example of this is how we've constructed paradigms around self-disclosure in behavioral health. So a lot of what we've been taught in our systems is, you know, don't disclose anything about yourself. You don't want to center yourself. This is about the other. You know, I've heard anecdotes at the IOL, people wouldn't wear wedding rings for many years because it was taboo, you know, to show to anybody that, uh, that you might have, you know, dare say a relationship with someone outside of work. Now, I actually think that we should push against some of those paradigms. And part of it is, you know, my lived experience. I don't get to choose how I look physically or the color of my skin. So there's aspects of my identity that I'm disclosing every day. Now, that doesn't mean to overshare. It doesn't mean to center our needs in that interaction. But what it does mean is it, it requires work to allow people to bring their human selves forward in a system that, that's sometimes pushed against that. Um, it means admitting what we don't know. And it means really uh, creating systems where staff recognize that it's by bringing their most authentic self to work, they're ultimately bringing their kindest self to work and their most honest self to work. Um, and, and I think that that reframe is necessary at this moment in history. And take us through that sense, that, that advice and looking at the world because some of what you're talking about is building resiliency. And there are some folks who are wired to thrive, right? It's the different, it, there's so many different kinds of us and that makes the world go round. That's beautiful. But it's fascinating as you're talking about this, there are the sharers and there are folks who feel the last year and a half so deeply for some, Take us through just what's happening for some folks where it may be paralyzing and other folks where resilience, they thrive on the crisis and that is what moves them forward. I'm, I'm curious a little of your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's, it's another great point. Um, one of the slides that I put up earlier talked about inclusive leadership and at the end there was a box that said accept diverse ways of coping. And so that touches on the point that you're making that different people are unique. There's a diversity of things that fill people's cups. For some, it might be completely unplugging. You know, for some, it might be plugging a little bit. For some, it might be connecting with family. For some, it might be completely isolating and cutting themselves off from the world. I think that's okay. We need to accept that there are diverse ways of coping. Everybody has a line of comfort and discomfort. What I would argue is that if we want to move towards a more humane system, we all need to recognize where our line is. Not worry about other people's lines or push people over their line or tell people you got to do this or you got to do that. Give people a sense of choice and agency. Recognize that we need to do the things we need to do to fill our cups, but also that if we're not ready to step over that line of discomfort and speak up or challenge ourselves, we're not going to be able to change the system. We're just going to nestle into that status quo. That's fascinating. As we get to 10.50, um, I do want to make sure that anyone who has, oh, I see a new question. Let me make sure that we get to all of our questions. Evan has a great question. You commented on the fact that we can all lead, but our current paradigm is vertical and can be experienced as having a power hierarchy that could be perceived as non-inclusive. What ideas could you share that embrace leading differently, encouraging change towards a more inclusive, caring, a sense of belonging culture? Great question, Evan. Great question, Evan. And I'm sure you, you can appreciate that some of this is, is what we're trying to do with the IOL, what I'm trying to bring uh, to the organization. Uh, and that's to bring my full human self into the role, to be honest and open, uh, to be inviting, and to really think about and be honest about the way in which hierarchical norms influence what we do. Um, I'm blessed to have had a lot of experience consulting to complex organizations in implementing these kinds of changes prior to joining the IOL and Hartford Healthcare. 
And what I know from this experience is there is no one size fits all to implementation. Every organization is going to be different. But one of the best ways to address that is again, to co-create that space. So that doesn't mean you ultimately blow up an organizational structure and make those structural changes right away because there's always gonna be compliance issues, risk issues, legal issues within the existing paradigm. But it does mean that we can be much more open and transparent. But what it requires, and I challenge all of us to think about this, when we're in moments of tension, our urge can often be, and this is proven through science, we're feeling powerless, we try to grab power, we try to grab control. And that leads us into these coercive cycles. And we see this happen all the time in healthcare and beyond. I think part of the challenge is the more stressed we are, our threshold gets lower. And then we're more likely to fall into those cycles, right? Those coercive cycles. So we need to recognize that we're in a time of stress and we will fall into these traps. But just being aware that if we see moments happening around us, that we need to literally and figuratively embrace the power of the pause step back from that moment and think about what's really happening here. How does this affect the power dynamic in the hierarchy of the system? And how can we step forward in a way that shares power rather than kind of hoards it um, in a way that feeds that, that polarizing cycle? Oh, those are great. I feel as though that is a perfect way to end our special, our conversation, our focus on health. Do you have, I like that as a, almost as a to-do to sort of take stock when you're in that moment, as many of us are at some moment, and sort of ask the why. Any other last words for our audience? And I wanna thank everyone who took part in our very special focus on health. Yeah, I do wanna just, again, thank everyone that's joined us today. But I also wanna extend an invitation to you all to be part of the co-authors of this next chapter of the IOL's history. I'm really excited about the potential we have. I think we have all the ingredients to again be global leaders in reimagining how we deliver care. Uh, and you are all part of that. So I would invite you to, to reach out, to engage, to be a part of us. There will be many opportunities through the bicentennial year and beyond to be part of, um, of being this kind of change. So please stay connected. Uh, and thank you so much for your, your support of the organization and look forward to, to staying in touch. Dr. Javid Sakara, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone with the remarkable team of philanthropy at Hartford Hospital. We are so grateful for all of our viewers, listeners, wherever you are. We're so thrilled that you are part of this very special conversation. The series is Focus on Health. We will see you next time. Thanks so much.